Um, okay, and for, let me launch into the introduction. I am very excited. I've been waiting and looking forward to this session for a long time. Um, we've got a session today, which will allow us to think across different levels of how um, we might bring eco-social education into institutions at different levels. Um, and we've got three people speaking from different experiences. On the one hand, campaigning to change uh, a national curriculum um, with a campaign that's addressed to the education ministry, which is what Florian Kalzeis will be uh, telling us about uh, based on the case of Austria, where Teachers for Future and Scientists for Future and others have been running a campaign with an open letter to the education ministry. So we want to think a bit about like what are the challenges and possibilities trying to do this kind of like campaigning from the outside and working with the media and raising awareness and so on. Um, then we will talk about um, what does it mean to work within uh, the public administration, which is where um, Dana Hansen, right? Jansen, sorry, uh, will um, will be telling us about her experience, their experience in um, in the Western Cape government. So um, that's like understanding what it's like to be in the institution, to try and work with schools, to try and make things happen, like get another perspective. And I think it's really important that we always also understand what it's like on the inside of institutions, right? Because we sometimes maybe too easily think that uh, it's very easy to do things on the inside and um, uh, and it's not. So I'm really looking forward to kind of getting into this understanding. And of course, also super excited to hear about how how people are thinking about um, eco-social education and climate crisis in relation to education in South Africa. Um, so that's um, that's going to be uh, also super interesting. Um, we shared a document with you of of, uh, of the education policy uh, in an email prior to today. I don't know if you saw it, but you've got it in your inbox. Um, and then we've got Buju Arik um, telling us uh, of experiences of basically working with policy. So. Um, more like trying to think about different policy frameworks and how that what that means trying to bring those into different institutions and I know that Bush has worked across a lot of different kind of big uh, institutions from UNESCO to others you will tell us yourself right but so that's like the question of, of transforming institutions um, a bit less from the point of view of being maybe, maybe a public servant or something like that but but working with policy and these kinds of frameworks and what kind of strategies challenges and limitations there are. So um, so I think it's a powerful combo we've got here. I'm really thankful that you're all taking the time to be with us. And um, um, and I don't know what else to say. Um, I think we'll just have the presentations, then we'll have a QA, and a um, we'll see if we want to go into breakout rooms or just all stay together. Um, and we would begin maybe in the order that I mentioned. So we have first Florian, then Dana, and then Bourjou. Um, so I would, I don't know if I'm forgetting anything, but if not, uh, I think I would just pass the mic to Florian. Looking forward. Thanks a lot. Uh, I try to share my screen. Um, oh, that's a chain board. Okay. Um, you can see the presentation? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay, so I'm Florian Kaltzes from Teachers for Future Austria. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited. Um, sorry for my English, um, but I'm doing my best here. Um, we try, we did a campaign together with Scientists for Future um, in Austria, together with other uh, partners supporting uh, the this open letter, um, and yeah, Teachers for Future is doing a lot of uh, political work. Uh, we are um, making um, different things, but uh, the most important uh, thing for us is the political work. Uh, we do not provide so much materials because we think there are enough providers for this. We try to focus on political work. Um, so we were looking for levers to realize our claims. Uh, we're active since March 2019. Um, and um, first was gathering experience and legal information about striking with schools. 
Um, and then the next step was to rephrase our claims to directly address the federal administration. Um, and now this campaign is about rephrasing our claims to directly address the ministry. Um, so the second time, because the first time we did this in 2019, but at that time it was more our own mission goal. Um, this time we really uh, tried hard to reach the ministry and we are happy that uh, this was successful. Uh, an open letter. Why, actually? Uh, our motivation was to realize that there is a lack of time and leverage. We all know, probably. Uh, and we were asking ourselves, okay, what we are doing right now is not effective and fast enough. What can we change? Uh, we were observing successful civil disobedience in the NGO last generation. Um, and last generation uh, identified three low-hanging fruits and made those the claim of their protest in Austria. Uh, and that inspired us. Uh, so next question was, what do we want to have in this open letter? Uh, what are those low-hanging fruits in the educational system in Austria? Um, the first one for us uh, is that every school needs an educational and sustainable development advocate. We call it a Klimabeauftragte. Um, a person that is uh, dedicated to this in every school and paid for this work. Second claim is to uh, uh, appropriate and mandatory implementation of education and sustainable development in school development plans. Um, so school development plans are a tool of Austrian schools, uh, kind of a business plan for the next four or five years. Um, and the ministry provides the frame for this plan. Um, and we need climate, we need a place for climate action in that. Uh, and the third is about exchange, about education and sustainable development. Um, first of all, um, we have this new term for Austria education system, new term uh, in the curric curriculum since autumn, uh, but actually educators do not yet really know what this term means. So we need time in every school um, to talk about this new term, to find a meaning for each school, what it means and how we want to uh, fulfill it. Um, our idea was that every school should have a conference in the upcoming school year. Uh, this is uh, would be very easily uh, to do the, by, by the ministry and um, it also wouldn't cost anything. Uh, and the second one is we need also regular meetings of federal and national educational institutions uh, to talk about education, sustainable development and also to uh, open for NGOs and experts. Um, okay, so the question was, um, how can we make sure we're seen by the ministry? Uh, first step was to understand the structures. Uh, we used existing contacts um, of eco-sensitive civil servants we knew already, and those were uh, all in low level, lower level departments of the ministry, and we discussed our idea and strategy with them. Um, then we started uh, public documents about different departments and their areas of responsibility. Uh, and based on that, we created a mailing list for the public letter. So we really had specific persons. Um, and we also always had a, a small sentence claiming why we think that especially this person has a certain responsibility um, in the context of this open letter. Um, this already made possible a few uh, meetings with lower level um, management servants, but um, we this was not enough for us. So we asked a reputable representative from Scientists for Future to directly contact the top management of the educational uh, ministry. Uh, and this was successful immediate. This really seemed to be a trigger for us to be to get a response. Uh, and the second 
part which was important for the success uh, was being seen in the public. We formed alliance to support the letter uh, by teachers for future, scientists, parents, psychologists, and grandparents for future. Uh, we paid for an official press re release, which was important. And we used the big mailing list of press ag agencies. Um, yeah, that we had already. Um, yeah, the success was, I would say, medium. Uh, the minister, after this call from the scientist, the minister responded in a public letter, uh, but actually he did not really make uh, any promises, but he informed us what the ministry is doing already. Uh, but a really uh, a good success is that we were invited for a meeting uh, by the Secretary General. This is really the second most important person in the educational ministry. And we also had other meetings, one with another top management servant and three with middle ma uh, management. Um, I shortly want before at the ending of the presentation, I shortly want um, to discuss pros and contrasts of our campaign from our point of view. Um, a uh, pro point is that uh, our reputation in the administration of education uh, rised. Um, so we are now a, a reputable, re reputable partner um, and it's easier for them to contact us um, and easier for us, of course. Um, it was sensibilization of, for the top management. Um, and Contra would be that uh, it binded really a lot of resource. It costs us, costed us a lot of time uh, to do this research. It also costs us a lot of time to do the preparation of these meetings. Um, and this time is less energy uh, for strike mobilization. Um, and of course, there is always this question, question um, is this a big effort for a small change? Um, the question of lack of time stays kind of a bit. And uh, also, um, we also always ask ourselves if this is also kind of on purpose to give us um, small successes uh, that cost a lot of effort. So we have to work on those and not on different things. Um, yeah, but I would say um, it was a, a successful campaign. We like working on it. We still have a lot of work at it. Um, and yeah, I personally, I see it very positive, very positively. Um, yeah, so thank you for having us here. And I'm curious about the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, so much in there, super rich. I think we'll 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 have a lot of material for discussion later. Um, really cool to see this also. I mean, I I read about I found this in the news. Um, being an Austrian who reads the news, so I mean, it does it did also uh, reach people like that. It's really exciting. Um, campaigning is a bigger topic. We could also have an entire session on. I feel like um, I wrote in our email. There's another really inspiring campaign at the University of Barcelona that was linked more to an occupation, so a bit more direct action and so on related. But um, that we also have a lot to learn from. That maybe we'll bring in in one of the future sessions, as an example. Um, yeah, a really amazing to have these thoughts also of really um, pro and contra and so on. Thank you so much. Um, Maybe I pass on to Dana at this point. Um, and then later, uh, if anybody already has questions burning, uh, then you could type them into the chat already. Or if not, obviously write them down and um, we'll have them all later. So uh, if you stop your screen share, Florian, or I can also turn that off, I think. I can pass over to you, Dana. Awesome. Thanks so much, Manuela. And wow, thanks, Florian, as well. I can already see actually a lot of parallels. Maybe you guys are a bit ahead, but I think a lot of the stuff that I've prepared to talk about, um, I see a lot of the kind of thinking that we're going towards is kind of answered in some of the stuff that you've that you've been working on. So um 
I'll be talking about our context as like what is the state of our current environmental education approach in South Africa, obviously on a national scale, even though I work at a provincial department. And I was, I'm just following the prompt that I was given a couple of weeks ago. I'll then also talk about uh, the process to get sort of amendments in curriculum. And then finally challenges, and I'll end on some positives as well, just to balance things out. Um, yeah. So as you might have seen in the document that was shared with uh, everyone in the previous email, we do have a national environmental education strategy that is set to run until 2029. And it's built upon previous strategies that we've had. Um, but this one really tries to call for the need for a stronger systems approach to contribute to the types of proactive responses that we'd like the youth and our citizens in general to have to face the mounting challenges of like climate change and biodiversity collapse and our social ills. And just looking directly at the text in the strategy, you know, we it's calling for a broader focus on strengthening that individual and collective participation in social ecological change, the kind that's necessary for development, resilience, adaptation, transformation, and to really empower people to learn um, and uh, to how to understand environmental issues and their risks and their causes and how to develop their own values and action competencies that are necessary to respond to all of these issues that we're facing. So with that being said, what's actually in the public school curriculum, um, you know, it, we generally do, students are exposed to concepts of like, you know, generally natural sciences, the environment, geography, climate, weather, across all levels as is relevant for the each grade. But, you know, so I work in a climate policy department, an environmental department, and we did sort of an informal ad hoc review of the curriculum and really only in the ninth and 10th grades. So that's like ages 15 to 16 um, is climate change literally stated as a term, you know, so the idea of global warming and the idea that it's human activity that is causing this. So that's, that's you know, slightly alarming, I would say. Um, and as a result of that, um, the real, everything that has been discussed, I think, so far in this forum, the kind of thinking that we really want kids to have, or students in general, uh, really gets um, satisfied through extracurricular activities, after school programs um, that have in, in large part been born out of support from the environmental education strategy. And then teachers obviously get the support through teacher workshops and teacher training, and they're often incentivized, you know, with career development points. So that helps. But I think the key thing is here is that it's really voluntary. It's not anything that is really state sanctioned or a prerequisite in texts or anything like that. So, and I mean, we have a very fertile policy environment that supports that. So it's kind of like on paper, we've got all of the, the motivations to do this, right? Um, the environmental sector skills plan, which then gave birth to the strategy, which you would have seen, is supported by all of the commitments that we have as a country coming down from internationally, the, the sustainable development goals, climate agreements. There's a continental education plan, which encourages all of the states of Africa to give stronger priority to environmental education and training. And then there's a regional plan as well for the Southern African development community. So I'm just trying to make it clear that we don't have an excuse not to be doing this, but that leads into uh, the process. And then you can probably see why it might be a bit more complicated. So uh, to actually get amendments and additions to any curricula in South Africa. Um, proposals can be submitted to the Department of Basic Education. So we have that department that deals with all education before tertiary, before college and university, and then we do have a Department of Higher Education. So a proposal will be should ideally be supported with through multiple consultations with a variety of stakeholders, um, including universities, the Department of Higher Education, schools, teachers, NGOs, civil society. 
and once that proof of concept is established and I guess passes certain checks and balances, then mediation has to take place across all nine provinces of the country, you know, in the interest of full democratic participation. And if, and if that is successful, then, you know, we can go through the process of rewriting and reviewing textbooks and then the whole supply chain procurement of the printing, <laughs> distributing. All of that being said, I think, the, and this is, touches on, I think, something that I picked up on in Florian's presentation right now. The call is best received if it comes from inside the house. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are channels in place for someone like me, for example. I don't work directly in education, but if I have enough um, support for my idea and my proposal and I have enough people interested and buy in, then there are channels to submit those proposals to the department. But it's obviously better if we have that internal advocacy quite um, strong and robust. So it's good for us to for have connections within the Department of Education and with teachers themselves. It just, it just, it's just received better if it comes from within that sort of grouping to have a successful proposal. And I'm sure you can tell with how I describe that. The challenge is obviously that is just bureaucracy at its best. Um, so the whole process of doing that sort of a, a changes, I know I was speaking broadly about education changes, not specifically environmental education, but I will get to that. So that whole process is really laborious. It's really tedious. I mean, in the public sector in South Africa, it's, it's almost like a running joke that it's our supply chain processes, if we even get to that level of the process that I described, are notorious for being one of the biggest barriers for any of our policy implementation or even the acquisition of funds to get things done. Um, so you can imagine that our syllabus reviews are extremely delayed and they're really not able to keep up with, you know, the change in climate science or like how, you know, we've been going through things like the mental health revolution, the gender revolution. So, and, and it doesn't really help either that I was in the prompt that I was given to prepare, I had to also think about what's the kind of political situation. And so, and this leads into, you know, I think a really important thing to remember when thinking about South Africa and especially a global South country, I think, is, uh, you know, oftentimes the idea of development is put as a complete bipolar opposite to environmental concerns or just eco-social justice in general. And in the political sphere right now, you know, we are economically and politically a developing country. And so we have our politicians who are in the mining sector who are not a fan of some of the climate commitments we have as a country. And they sort of ride on that, you know, that, oh, but how can we develop if we shift to renewables? And you can just imagine which obviously we know is not true, but it's really hard, you know, so we find ourselves at this juncture of like, how do we convince people who, you know, are so worried about what they're gonna eat tonight? And, you know, we have load shedding, I'm sure Karen, you know, <laughs> this is something we live with all the time. Load shedding is basically, we have a schedule of rolling blackouts to deal with the fact that our grid is overloaded with our demand, our electricity grid. So, and, and that's so interesting to me personally, and I, so many people share this thinking as well, is that we are literally living through a lot of issues that would be solved by if we could just engender that eco-social thinking from a young age and even across our institutions that would help us come over, overcome rather these situations. I mean, and this comes to a key point I wanted to say that, you know, our democratic state is only 30 years old it's only four years older than me and before 1994 um basically all policy and i'm going to get to talking about education policy specifically again now but just imagine that like before 1994 everything infrastructure education policy was only catering really to a minority the white minority and after 1994, suddenly all of these systems, infrastructure, the grid, everything had to then account for suddenly everyone is considered an equal and deserving citizen. And so when it comes to education policy, 
you know, it's all reflected, right? Um, there's an act to be making up for that gap. So before 1994, um, a lot of the education specifically for non-whites and specifically for black kids wasn't really um, preparing them to go into the STEM fields. It was mainly gearing them to go into more menial labor. And, you know, if you look at the discourse around conservation and biodiversity, it's always often seen as a sort of an elite concern or a concern that the white man has. So I think that, you know, uh, at least in the spaces that I move in, we deal with the, uh, the issue that our work has a marketing problem still. And it's like, you know, how can you, like, like what I said earlier, how can you get someone whose life is directly being impacted by a lot of these stuff to see how they're so entwined in this and that it's not just a privileged person's concerns. Or, or to rather throw their hands up and say, well, why don't they figure it out? Why don't we, why can't we work together? So all of that being said, like I said at the start, the main way that the real type of thinking that we want in schools is mainly through after school activities and seen as an add on. Um, that is kind of where we're sitting because with trying to reform our education in the past 30 years it's gone through four curriculum changes and teachers i mean the world over are overworked and underpaid and they're trying to we're still trying to meet those gaps at least in the public school system you know it's definitely not the case across the board we have really good private schools or alternative schools but it's really for the majority of people if the if the passion doesn't come from teachers, and that's why I again come back to like that advocacy and like seeing, seeing examples like Florence example and others, it's so important because if teachers themselves don't see how they're gonna add this onto their long list of things that they have to do, and if and it's also good if you know principals also see the benefit of their schools, maybe signing their schools up for things, then it's really rare that this happens. That be that as it may, they're really good people in the system that really want this change. I just don't think that there is a standardized process yet. Besides, like I said, that really long process of getting changes in the curriculum. So right now we really rely on our partnerships with NGOs and with interested people who are willing to put in a little bit extra. And that leads into what I want to end on. So what saves us, where there are inroads for success is that, you know, considering what we went through as a country, we have, a very strong advocacy culture, grassroots movements, the struggle movements. So what you see is that a lot of youth are kind of like looking at what their parents went through and being like, oh, that was my parents' struggle. This is my struggle right now. My struggle is the climate crisis. It's the eco-social crisis. So a lot of them are really, you know, they're inspired by, you know, like the Greta Thunbergs and we have a, our own little local celebrities and they often end up partnering or getting sponsorships with fellowships with you know NGOs or other organizations and then they're able to sort of like speak their truth and like reflect the the on the ground experiences of people in more lower income communities in general and also bring back information bring back their thinking so i think what i'm trying to say is like i said earlier that we have the policy that totally supports that we should be doing this. And, and in, in the strategy share, there's a, we have an action, I think there's an action in there that literally one of the roles that has to be achieved is greater advocacy internally. So if that's on paper. External to government, we have so much movement. It's just, it's not all coordinated in a cut and dry sort of fashion. So it's really about trying to find people to partner with and empowering the voices to get people to see, oh, I see you look like me or you've gone through something like me. And um, you care about this, maybe I should care about it too. And the last thing I'd like to say is that, you know, in, in the spirit of eco-social justice, one of the other things that, you know, many post-colonial countries have to contend with is that, you know, the idea of like erased cultures and um, oppressed peoples. So where there's really a lot of passion right now is, sort of reclaiming and re-empowering indigenous narratives, indigenous culture. And, and oftentimes, you know, those are linked to being, living more in communion or more in harmony with the environment and extracting resources more consciously. And I think 
that's an inroad that I've been seeing a lot of people that they'd rather use that sort of framing rather than maybe just absorbing the way that the jargon is used or the narratives are used maybe from the global north. So I think it's really about Africanizing and contextualizing the language and the story for us. And and I, I don't really know where we're gonna, when that's all gonna happen eventually, but I mean, there's a lot happening. So yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you so much there again. Oh, I knew why I was looking forward to this session. Um, super rich. It's also amazing to just hear like an actual description of what the process of changing the curriculum is from the inside, um, because it's um, very hard for people like me to actually imagine that. Um, and yeah, I can, I can understand. Uh, pretty tough. I would also love to hear you maybe later in the questions. I will ask you to talk more about where this climate change directorate also comes from, as in like just as an institution and so on, because the the historical background to me would be very interesting. But um, but maybe we shift through the presentations first. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also so grateful that we can have this uh, kind of South African experience here and learn with you. Um, and then I would pass over to Burju with another set of super rich um, reflections and experiences. Um, I'm going to unpin you or um, un remove your spotlight. Um, and over to you, Burju. You'll also share a presentation, right? So, Thank you so much. Uh, well, I um, thank you. Very valuable. Uh, I took notes uh, from Florian and uh, Dana. Uh, my experience is a bit mixed, so I bear with me, and please ask questions if you you know if I confuse your minds. But I uh, work. Uh, I mainly work at Education Reform Initiative. We monitor education policy K twelve education policy in Turkey from teachers policies, content, outcomes, outputs, um, access to education, right to education, girls' education, uh, right freedom to, to religion, et cetera, and non-religion uh, ideas, obviously. But I also, uh, I'm on the board of Fruits and Shoots Turkey, which Jane Goodall founded internationally. We work with young people mainly uh, to to give them a floor. In Turkey, it's a bit difficult. Uh, I founded Nature Playhouse. It's a kind of area where I design games. Um, the network of education policy centers. I really would like to introduce to you because uh, it's on Balkan, West, East Balkan, Balkan, East Europe, uh, Turkey, and Central Asia and Caucasia countries, uh, education policy centers from, from, from these regions. And our latest uh, strategy focus on uh, eco-social justice. Actually, we are trying to develop a kind of framework internationally uh, with, the, with, with teachers uh, from, from these countries. I'm also part of Education Expertise Committee in UNESCO Turkey. And very recently, uh, I wanted to share, Amerisa is here as well. I became a part of International Degrowth Network's Transformative Learning. I'm just learning, I'm very recent, but I wanted to mention because uh, there is a good discussion on transformative learning, which I am eager to learn from them as well. Uh, but uh, our biggest problem is, is uh, really the polarization, I would say, in, in the society. Uh, that, that is huge in any issue that you can, you can think of like, you know, elections, obviously, local elections, education, on any issue, schools, teacher policies, etc. immediately the society divides into two. And the xenophobia is increasing. Uh, we have uh, around 5 million Syrian refugees in Turkey, illegal refugees. We, you know, we have so many uh, uh, not on paper uh, people, refugee people actually, and this causes huge tension in the country. That is why uh, the eco-social policy discussions, but both policy and implementation is actually, we try to uh, gather people together around the table to discuss any issue because we, we really miss that and it's, you know, we are becoming more authoritarian country. 
uh, that's a huge, huge problem, unfortunately. That is why, actually, I will show you some key examples from what we are doing on both implementation and policy level that, uh, that may help us, I don't know. Uh, but this is a photo image from Kate uh, Wright's Becoming with article from Duke University's Environmental Humanities Lexicon, which I, uh, which I actually share with, with the teachers community in, in Turkey as well, because this reflects, it's from 70s and in the, from the States, but it reflects the separation between human and nature, and also human and human, uh, I would say that's what we are metaphoring. Uh, they are uh, smiling, but actually, in in five minutes, they hit by lightning. Hopefully, they you know they nothing happened to them uh, physically, but emotionally, uh, horrible things happened. And the the sister was taking the photograph. Uh, so the 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 disconnection between humankind and Earth. Uh, is actually shows reflects where we are, and we wanted to. Uh, in the policy documents and in the implementation phases, we really want people to understand, teachers particularly, to understand the separation. Uh, separation between human and human and also human and nature or, you know, anything. But the solutions, that's also critical because most of the solutions that we actually built in Turkey uh, they have unforeseen consequences. That's why, actually, although Turkey has a, a long history of environmental education, for example, uh, we are not getting anywhere because you know the 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 framework, the philosophy is 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 not set up right, unfortunately, or the, the implementation uh, projects uh, that are taking us to the wrong paths. I would say. Um, like you know, like the zoos, uh, obviously they are bringing. You know, these are the places where Turkish teachers use quite a lot for kids to have a kind of empathy to towards other animals, organisms, but they don't question the lifestyle and the link between their lifestyle and the orangutans uh, to them. So this is also critical. Uh, we start with this questioning. I will start with these questions. I will give several examples and then I will again, uh, sorry for my English as well. It's been a while since I uh, talk uh, in English. Uh, but this, this is, this is uh, for example, forest uh, schools now popping up everywhere in Turkey, unbelievably, uh, everywhere. Yeah, and from the east to the west to north, everywhere, even in the, in the steppe areas, uh, but, uh, they are just, you know, they are they are just taking kids to to nature. Uh, there is no philosophy behind. Of course, there are good examples, but most of them no philosophy behind. Uh, and maybe they are this harming rather than uh, actually empowering the the relation between human and nature. These these are the critical questions that I I think uh, we should ask. And Turkey is a country where actually uh, policies and implementations uh, we borrow from uh, from other uh, countries other regions and we implement them directly without questioning uh, or, or without you know uh, locally uh, improving them let's say this is also a kind of could be a problem for for turkey as well that is why coming from there, uh, there is a policy, teacher policy that we achieved with the Ministry of Education in Turkey. Uh, every year we did, we actually, uh, we invite teachers from all around Turkey. By the way, we have uh, 1.2 million teachers uh, at K-12 and uh, 17 million students in, in Turkey. It's a huge community. Uh, and they are completely different from each other. Uh, so the Good Practices in Education Conference, we actually gather, we invite teachers from all around Turkey, from all levels. Uh, and each year we chose a team, and this year we chose planetizenship or earth kinship, as you may imagine. But uh, during the last conference, actually, uh, we changed our uh, way of doing as well, so we started working two years ago and we planted 
what is planet citizenship? We, we actually did some research, we asked teachers, we asked students, uh, and then we invite their uh, good practices in education and we come up with, we came up with kind of principles on planet citizenship, how we can integrate in, in uh, any policy in, 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 in not only in curriculum, uh, but also in designing schools, etc. So we we developed really good principal documents uh, in Turkey, which I hope uh, will will we will be able to disseminate. But um, Turkey is another is a country. I'm sure that you you have the same as well. Uh, mostly we mostly focus on um, minds. That is why actually through reading clubs or to, through haiku retreats. Uh, we try to really integrate emotion part of of ecosocial pedagogy into the uh, into the education policies. That's missing because when you are talking about climate education and you are talking about environmental education, you immediately start to teach kids or teach teachers. Uh, but these are the reading clubs, you know, fiction uh, particularly, not nonfiction, through fiction, through poetry. Uh, uh, it's important, to, I, we believed and we showed the results as well, to come together, to share emotions on, on common areas such as uh, a love of nature or, you know, uh, trying to transforming our lifestyles, etc. to build a, a better today or, or a f future. Uh, and this is the haiku that I would like to share, which I really believe is, is, is very, very beautiful. Uh, we really walk on hell, on earth particularly nowadays, gazing at flowers, and you, your examples are also flowers for me. Uh, but we also actually, for, for, there are different mi minority, minority groups. I, I don't want to call minority, but you know, Turkey is calling them minority. The different groups, and they generally don't come together, and there's a huge segregation between the schools. If you belong to a socioeconomic background, you go immediately to wet schools or you know religious schools, for example or in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in your own environment. So you don't come across with different cultures, different, um, with different groups. And that is why we also design a kind of My Nature Friends box, a cabinet of curiosities. It has environmental sustainable principles as well. You can't uh, collect flowers, for example, you need to find from the already dead ones. Uh, but we occasionally know we uh, purpose choose, for example, a school from Istanbul, Metropolitan, the biggest city in Turkey, from the uh, eastern city, uh, which is Kurdish territory, so they can come together, they, they don't know each other, so they, they share, they exchange, they write letters, and they come across uh, uh, their different perspectives on nature and their own en environment as well. So this is critical for us. I will share very briefly, this, this is what we call edge effect. Um, different habitats, different cultures should come together. Schools were supposed to uh, achieve that, but unfortunately so segregated in Turkey. So it's unbelievable. So this is a kind of example of uh, uh, of uh, yes. And also we would like to transform the idea of nature as good and beautiful. So uh, we actually invite people for uncanny presences like thorny uh, plants, which actually they are, the municipalities are cutting off because they are, you know, giving harm to kids, children, etc. But you know, we are trying to change that perspective through games or you know uh, through other uh, discussions in Turkey. This is she is my daughter. This was during COVID, and municipality was again. Uh, was cutting off the weeds uh, because you know they are bringing beetles, etc., bees, etc. But we actually wrote their names with my daughter, and this became a kind of uh, example for for different parts of Turkey. And when people were walking around, they, uh, you know, we invite them that there are other neighbors around us, uh, other than animal, uh, other than human. Uh, so this kind of things, small things. But I believe that uh, polarized to, to it could be critical, simple, but could be critical to to um, to invite polarized people in the same purpose. So while we are discussing on um, 
policies and implementations, we immediately see several tricksters or concepts, as you may think, uh, to, to change the perspective, to change the um, idea, to change the way we are doing. So the Care Manifesto Care Collective is, is a really good trickster for us. Uh, to care for ourselves, for um, for each other, for other animals, etc. Uh, but while we are while doing so, uh, another critical uh, trickster or concept is the diffraction of Karen Barak, because when you you know invite an idea or discuss an idea, we immediately polarize. Uh, therefore, we invite people or we invite policy making processes not to subtract the idea of the others but to to think with them to learn from them etc it's not easy but there are uh, several tools that we achieved uh, i hope i don't know where it will take us but it's critical so i won't go through all i will share the document with you but these are the key concepts that immediately we uh, we, we believe uh, that helped us to change the perspective of teachers at good practices conferences for example here, one thing is the edge effect, the dimension or ecotone from ecology, as you mentioned, two different habitats. When they come together, there is more resilience and there is more diverge effect. And we would like not to monoculture Turkey, uh, etc. The the philosophy behind when developing education policy. We implemented the idea of uh, multi-species justice and eco-social justice to to the Ministry of Tur Ministry of Education in Turkey. Uh, not yet there, but you know they they opened their eyes, which was critical. Uh, at least some some uh, directorates of the Ministry of Education. Uh, but it is important for us to because there are many different concepts now going on around international discussions where they are uh, coming across. Uh, so we want to really uh, kind of uh, think as as ecosocial justice as a continuum of other justice discussions so far. Uh, so it is important that it's not it is not a new thing, but it is a kind of continuum of the previous uh, works of of other justice discussions. That's important for us to understand the history behind. Uh, uh, several more slides, and I will fi finalize it uh, soon. Uh, therefore, actually, while doing this uh, education policy making processes and implementation models, I would say, uh, we focus on arts of noticing of myself, community, and those who are made others to us, like for Turkish Kurds are the others, or for Turkish Greeks are the others. Uh, uh, Syrians are now the others, women are the others, etc. Children are the others, uh, uh, let's say. Uh, so these, uh, these arts of noticing is important in policy making and we invite coalitional thinking co to coalitional action. So, uh, no, I won't, I won't discuss this kinship, but these are the critical uh, changing and discussing points uh, which we develop uh, implementation uh, and po policy making. Currently, what we achieved is uh, Ministry of Education uh, designed, started to design K-12 competencies on sustainability. And throughout the discussions and good practices in education or, or, or all, all these uh, practices, I would say, uh, we achieved to implement, uh, integrate eco-social justice uh, issues in, in the K-12 competencies. We will see, but then the minister changed and we will see if they will implement from next year onwards. So thank you for listening. <laughs>